All right, so this one's going to be a little bit of a shorter lecture compared to that last one we did. We're going to talk a little bit more about infectious keratitis, but we're going to cover some of the viral things that you see. So we're going to go through the viral causes of keratitis. We'll talk about how to create a differential diagnosis, which is fairly simple in this situation. Um, some things to be looking for to try to determine what the correct etiology is. Um, what we do for testing, and then thinking about some of the other things that are going on when you have the viral keratitis. Some of the long-term consequences are a lot different here compared to bacterial keratitis. And then we'll talk a little bit about recurrence and treatment and prophylaxis. So when you're thinking about viral keratitis, really the causes are herpes, 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 herpes. And then you have Epstein-Barr virus, CMV, which are, can sometimes play a role, but most commonly, these are herpes viruses. Um, so the ways to sort of think about what's going on with a patient that comes in with keratitis when you're thinking of viral etiologies is trying to figure out what's involved in the cornea. So is this an epithelial process? Is it the stroma? Is it both? Is it the endothelium? Is there an anterior chamber reaction? You know, is there inflammation going on? Do you have a hypopion? Do you have high pressure? So you're trying to just figure out what part of the cornea is involved. Some of the various characteristics of the viruses, so if you're thinking about herpes simplex virus, um, typically the classic finding is epithelial dendrites. And the dendrites in this situation will have kind of a terminal bulb on the end of them. Um, if you compare some other things that you can see, they, they try to differentiate the iris translumination defects so um, the herpes viruses will have translumination defects in the iris and uh, typically there's more of a diffuse iris um, translumination problems with simplex compared to zoster that will have more of a sectoral defect. Um, then you're, you're thinking about if you're trying to say okay is this herpes or is it zoster. Zoster has more of pseudodendrites. Who can tell me what that is more so than a dendrite? Elevation. They're definitely going to be more elevated, but they both can be. You're, you're trying to. You're more looking for um, dendrites that don't necessarily have that terminal bulb on the end of them. And I'll show you some pictures of what these look like. Um, but when you're looking at the iris, you might see just like a sectoral translumination defect rather than kind of diffuse iris atrophy. Um, when you're looking at EBV and CMV. Um, these typically present with like an endotheliitis, and so you have some decimase folds, and it's a lot of times kind of like a plaque or a, sort of a round area of endothelium that's affected with uh, overlying corneal edema. Um, and then, you know, you can have an anterior chamber reaction in pretty much any of these, so any of them can present with iritis. So this is a pretty typical look for um, herpes simplex. You can see kind of these crusting lesions here. Um, in this guy he had kind of a conjunctivitis as well. And so it's pretty typical to have something kind of going on around the mouth or around the nose and then the, their eye will be red. And so you're, these, this is what you would think of with uh, herpes simplex. Another one that's pretty bad here um, herpes simplex, conjunctivitis clearly, and then uh, some, a pretty bad rash around the nose. So this one, what do you think about this? Somebody describe this for us. different. These are two different oh, pictures. Okay. So you're seeing a bunch of kind of patchy stromal haze. This is pretty typical of what simplex will look like later on when you just have stromal involvement. It just kind of looks like this hazy cornea. You're not exactly sure what's going on. Is it an old scar is kind of what it looks like, but um, that's a pretty typical appearance. And then this is kind of a big um, ulceration of the cornea, which is typical as well for herpes simplex. And you can see, like if you're thinking 
you see somebody with an epithelial defect like this and you're wondering like, what else should you be thinking about? What kind of stuff are you thinking in this situation? Other than herpes? Like a bacterial ulcer. Yeah, so what's different about this compared to a bacterial ulcer? Like if you're thinking about what it looks like. Yeah. So you've got kind of this surrounding haze, right, that, that comes clear away from the area that seems to be the most affected. Um, you've got this ulceration that looks pretty clean, right? It's not soupy, it's not really white, there's not a lot of mucus coming off of it. Um, the area around it looks pretty quiet. So that's pretty typical of a, of a herpes simplex ulcer. What else? What else would you be thinking about in this situation? It's maybe in the lower half of the cornea. Staph marginal. Could be staph marginal. These are usually elevated, pretty white looking. Chemical pyramids. Sure, yeah, definitely. Chemical can look like that. What if this person is on the burn unit and they can't close their eye? Exposure. So exposure. These that's probably Probably the hardest thing to differentiate in a lot of cases is exposure, keratopathy versus herpes simplex. Um, because a lot of times they're kind of in similar places and they look kind of similar too. But uh, you would, if you cultured this or sent for PCR, you would probably come up with a diagnosis there. Okay, what about this one? Nico, what do you think? Can you describe what it's looking like? It's a sterile photograph. Um, and there seems to be in the center of the corneal, the corneal haze, a circular one, and surrounding it more uh, temporally, and just around it is like another haze again. So this, the center of the lighting obviously is like brown, which is really weird, really. Yes, yeah, so you've got this whole cornea is pretty clear over here, right? Yep. Looks pretty normal. But then you get into this kind of patchy haze. It's kind of coming off the limbus a little bit. There's not a lot of vascular tissue coming in. And so you've got kind of this round, central, hazy spot right in the center. And this is pretty classic for this discoform keratitis, which you see in simplex as well. All right, what about this one? Reese, what do you think on this one? Um, just, again, kind of patchy areas. Yes, you'll see, you'll see a lot of patients with this. Um, they'll come in and say, I can't see. It's been going on for a week. What do you think? I think it's been going on for a week? No. So it takes a while for these blood vessels to grow in, right? So they're kind of a response to inflammation. It's been going on for a really long time. So with interstitial keratitis, the, the top thing on your differential diagnosis is herpes simplex. Um, and pretty classic that you get these big ropey vessels coming in. You'll see haze kind of at the edge of the vessels. Um, if it's kind of white, then it's usually just the herpes part of it. If it's starting to turn yellow, then you're thinking more of lipid deposition into the cornea. Zoster um, doesn't do that? Zoster definitely can oh. do it as well. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate which one it is because in many cases this is not like an active infection. This is more of like the immune response to the herpes virus, so um, it could be either one. You treat it pretty much the same. You try to treat it with some topical antivirals, see if it works, if it usually doesn't do anything, but steroids can sometimes help. Um, there's been a lot of different ways that people have talked about treating this. Some people try it. You can put Avastin sort of at the limbus, try to get these vessels to regress. Um, steroids can work. Um, you can actually go in and ablate these vessels with either an argon laser or cautery. Um, you can actually suit your vessels closed if there's like a really big one that won't close with cautery. Um, in a lot of cases these will kind of regress with time and steroids, um, but some of those other interventions can help too. What if you were to say, okay, this is uh, four years later, we've tried everything. What's the next, what's the next treatment? This is what it looks like four years later. It's not getting better, their vision still sucks. What would you do before that? 
What do you exhaust before a cornea transplant? See this nice clear area up here? If you can smooth out some of the irregular astigmatism with a potential contact lens, you might be able to buy him some time. Try it. Send him to the optometrist. Get a contact lens fitting. If it doesn't work, then you're looking at a PK. So if I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to do a cornea transplant on this patient, they probably have a herpes virus. What are some of the issues that I'm going to deal with? Reactivation. Definitely. Reactivation. So what are you going to do? You think prophylactic or dosing. treatment dosing, right? So you're going to put them on treatment dosing acyclovir probably a week prior to surgery, and then you're going to keep them on it for probably six to eight weeks after, and then kind of slowly taper off acyclovir or Valtrex. What else? What else is an issue with these so diseases? Sometimes they have uh, neurotrophic corneas, so yep. they won't go to a heart attack. Yeah, so you, the first step of a cornea transplant healing is getting the patient's skin to grow over the donor, right? And that's going to take a while in herpes patients in a lot of cases, and sometimes it won't ever heal. And so in these patients, we tend to do a tarsorophy at the time of PK to try to help them. And a tarsorophy, we pretty much close the eye, and you know, you give yourself a little slit to look through, but um, just to make sure that cornea is doing okay. But just keeping the eye closed as long as you can is sort of the best thing for them in these situations. And is that because of a neurotrophic cornea, mm -hmm. or is it because they just don't heal as well? It's, that's the reason they don't yeah. heal. Yeah, they're essentially, they're, um, their corneal nerves are shot. That's where these infections affect a lot of times is the corneal nerves. And so they have decreased corneal sensation, they have decreased growth factors, and so the skin just doesn't grow as well. Um, the last thing that you're at really high risk of is rejection that has nothing to do with the virus, right? It's just the cornea has a higher risk of rejecting because of these nasty blood vessels that are already going to be at the graft host junction, right? And so sometimes you have to treat these patients with oral steroids or higher dose steroids for longer. Um, and you run into the complications of uh, glaucoma, high pressure, sometimes they end up with a tube or a shunt of some kind. So these eyes can be a lot of trouble to recover. And so when you're having discussions with patients, okay, let's do a PK. A PK in general puts you at risk of glaucoma, just even in a normal patient. And so you have an even higher risk in somebody who has herpes simplex virus or some other interstitial keratitis just because they're at high risk of rejection, you're going to have them on high dose steroids, they have higher risk of ocular hypertension than glaucoma, and so it's a tougher decision to make when you're in these situations. So, but that's what we do. We're an academic institution. We do a lot of these cases. So, sorry, can you, so when do you, when do you, look, when do you look into like TB and other causes of interstitial keratitis? Like I, think we, I think you would initially test for everything. Um, TB is something that you definitely want to treat. Syphilis is something that you definitely want to treat. So those are probably the two most common things. Um, sarcoid is another one we tend to test for. Um, it's, it's hard to make the diagnosis in a lot of cases as to what's going on. So you kind of treat it in a lot of cases like herpes if you're moving forward on treatment for surgery and things. Um, so this is kind of a picture of diffuse iris atrophy, and you can see a lot of translumination defects in, I don't, I don't know if this is just a white red reflex, or I think it's a, just the camera that did that, but you can see all these translumination defects that are just kind of chewing up the iris all over. That's what you would typically see in a herpes simplex case. All right, so let me describe what this one's kind of looking like. Yeah, so you're kind of looking in here, you've got all these little dots here, you've got a few down here. It's, it's pretty tough to tell on a straight on image, but probably some endothelial involvement, right? And a pretty angry eye, right? You got all these, this limbal flush with all these blood vessels coming in. So I love these, uh, these uh, terms. You've got keratouveitis, kind of keratoconjunctivitis. Those are kind of ways that you can sound smart. I've got a I have a patient with keratoconjunctivitis. Their eyes red and their cornea is hazy, right? 
or I've got a, a patient with keratouveitis. Their cornea is hazy and they've got an anterior chamber reaction. Um, and so that, that's going to be at the top of your differential is uh, the herpes simplex viruses in a situation like this where the cornea looks kind of hazy, probably a little swollen. You've got inflammation. The surface of the eye is obviously involved. Um, a lot of cases, the pressure will be up in this situation as well. And so, um, Reese, what would you treat this? Uh, probably give them like high dose ACE lipomere and then um, after they've been on that for a little bit, start some steroids. Yeah, give them a couple days of ACE for sure, get them going on it, and then probably start steroids pretty quick. When, when you have inflammation inside the eye, the sequelae of that is, is bad, right? What are some of the issues you run into if you have anterior chamber, iritis? What are some of the long-term consequences? Sneaky eye. Sneaky eye, which direction? direction? Both, right? I mean, the iris is inflamed. It's going to stick down to whatever it can touch. And so you want to get these patients with their pupil dilated, right? I hate atropine in these situations because what atropine does, it brings the pupil really big and then makes it sit there. It doesn't move. When you put somebody on like cyclopenylate, their pupil will dilate and it'll move a little bit still because it's not as strong of a, of a dilator and so it'll, it'll prevent some of those posterior sinicae. Why do we use that more often? I mean, they always use that more often. I don't know. I don't use it. I don't use atropine very often. Retina cases, they can use atropine, but there's not really a reason to use it otherwise. The, the, main, the other thing is that patients come in and they're like, why the heck is my eye dilated and it's been like two weeks because yeah, lovely atropine. And you can actually get some iris atrophy from atropine too, where the, the pupil kind of stays a little bit big. So yeah, you want to dilate them because if their pupil gets stuck down and it's two millimeters, it's not good. You can't see what's going on in the back of the eye. You have to go and do surgery to sort of expand the iris sometimes and a lot of times you'll, for, you'll potentially create a cataract when you're trying to do that kind of a surgery. So try to get their pupil dilated. They're also more comfortable. Uh, Chris, why are they more comfortable if you dilate them? Uh, because it's painful when their iris, their iris is sort of spasming from the inflammation. Yeah, you got some inflammation going on in there. Their iris is spasming. The cilia of your body spasm. So if you can uh, dilate them, it'll get, it'll get rid of that as well. So they're a little more comfortable. It's kind of a catch-22. You're like, their eyes light sensitive, so I'm going to dilate them, but it's more of that ciliary spasm that drives them nuts. Lines on the cornea. You, just, you don't see lines on the cornea, right? That's not a natural thing. So this is just kind of a weird endotheliitis. What if this patient had a PK out here? So this would be like one of those rejection lines be worried about. When, when you see this, what's happening is you're getting destruction of, of the endothelium kind of on this side and it's heading out this way. It's like the, the marching of the, of the army that's heading out to destroy the cornea. So if you, can, if you can halt it here, their vision will be fine, but if, you, if it gets out into here, into the center of their pupil, then they're, they're in trouble. So H, HSV, and endotheliitis. When you, when you see endotheliitis, it really could be any of them. It's hard to distinguish which virus it is. Um, luckily, you can kind of treat them all the same. When I don't know which virus it is, I treat with Valtrex because the dosing is the same. Give them a thousand milligrams three times a day. You know, if you what, what if you're treating simplex, Ashley? What do you? you do, what dosing are you doing usually? You do like 800 times a day. Yeah. No. Sorry. No. Simplex. <laughs> simplex. Oh. Simplex is 400 five times a day, or 800 three times a day. Same dosing, right? Probably get you the same viral, uh, antiviral load. Um, whereas with Zoster, you're given a higher dose, so 800 milligrams five times a day, or Valtrex three times a day, or Famvir 500 milligrams three times a day. There's lots of different ones. Sometimes you run into patients who have side effects from the antivirals, so you have to kind of class switch and figure out which one they can handle. Okay, what about this one? Mike? It kind of looks uh, as far as a little spot in the brain, similar to the one we described where it could be some uh, characteristic of haze, and then you also have the, some haze, like from the cornea, and the cornea, and the cornea, and the cornea. 
Yes, you've got all these little spots here. They're all in the endothelium. Um, you can kind of tell where they are in this picture, but it's hard for sure without being able to sort of adjust lights and things. If you go right along the back of the endothelium here, you can see that this one kind of juts out, and this one kind of juts out, and that one maybe. So it, you can still tell in this picture that it is sort of on the inside layer of the cornea. These are the pictures you're going to get on boards, and you're going to be like, uh, how am I supposed to know what depth that's at? I don't really know. But you say, okay, what in the cornea looks like that? KP look like that. And it's, it's about just kind of looking at lots of different pictures. So there's that term that you can use. You know, it's keratouveitis. You've got cornea involvement with a uveitis of some kind. So keratic precipitates. Okay, how about this one? I, I know I labeled all these, but it's good to just describe them and talk about them a little bit. Want to take it? What are you seeing? On, on the left, I mean, I see... Yeah, the one on the left. Looks like <clears throat> definitely some haze in the peripheral cornea, and I don't know if you just described it as melting in the middle, but it's kind of like a gelatin-like appearance. Good. And, I mean, I don't know if you see some kind of blood in that mid-gelatin, kind of that darkish red spot. This spot here? Yeah, I'm not sure that's blood or what. <laughs> it's that. iris. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But why do you see perfect. iris there? There's a perforation. Maybe. No. Could be, but... Along the same lines, there's thinning, right? So if you've got an area, this is something to watch for on exams. This is the type of case where you would want a Seidel because you're not 100% sure you know, how thick the cornea actually is. You can sort of tell in this picture, you've got kind of a thick beam of light here, and then right here, it changes, right? Rather than being sort of convex, it switches to concave right there on that beam. So the beam's a little thinner, so it's telling you that it's kind of excavated, like you were seeing, like a melt. So it's thinning there. Um, and then you've got these areas where it's pretty diffusely hazy, and then all of a sudden there's a spot where it's kind of clear. And you worry about that spot being really thin. Because otherwise, if there was some meat of cornea that's thick and hazy, you'd be fine and you wouldn't be able to see the iris. So you essentially have an ulceration of the cornea. In this situation, if this patient first presented to you, this could be anything. Right? So they're not complaining of any pain. It's pain free. Zero pain, they just can't see. So that's telling you, okay, the, the corneal nerves are involved here. They're kind of shot. So you're thinking more along the lines of a herpes virus, but you're going to culture this for everything. Um, Reese, what are you thinking about if you're going to culture this? What are you going to do? You're going to scrape right there, right? So in this, in most cases, you want to get down to the base of the ulcer. In this situation, you want to stay away from thin areas. And so you might scrape kind of on that down edge, sort of out here, over here. And you'd want to send this for viral PCRs and all the bacterial cultures. What about the picture on the right? There's a little spot that's labeled. So you've got kind of this hazy cornea. Not a lot of inflammation sort of around it, but you can tell that the, the conge is pretty injected, inflamed. This area is maybe missing the epithelium, maybe not. And then you've got this one little spot. It almost looks like a metallic foreign body, doesn't it? A little rust ring. Well, this one, I guess, according to Kachmer and Pele, Kratchmer, sorry, this is a little perforation in the cornea with the herpes etiology. They had a cytel test on it that showed that it was positive. So you can tell herpes simplex is kind of tough, right? It can present as a lot of different things. Um, there's, it's always got to be on your differential diagnosis. Always got to be thinking of it. it, it luckily, the treatment is pretty safe, right? Valtrex is kind of expensive. That's the main side effect of it. It's hard on the wallet, but otherwise it's a safe medication. And Dr. Tabin always used to say, why is it safe? Why is acyclovir and valley cyclovir, why are these medications really safe in patients? What's the key to their activation? Spiral kinase. Yeah, so they are activated. They're only sort of converted to active drug by live virus, right? Otherwise, the body just passes it right through, doesn't use it. So that's why it's a nice, safe medication. Um, who do you have to, what sort of things do you have to watch out for if you're going to treat somebody with acyclovir? So kidney function, you might have to reduce your dosing because it gets cleared by the kidney, right? That's the main thing. What about 
question. So, um, when you do oral versus topical, it seems like we just do oral, but um, I know some patients come in a lot of times and they're on topical. So yeah, so topical antivirals are good for epithelial disease, essentially. So in somebody with classic dendrites, I treat with, I would treat topical. Pretty much no other time, honestly, because there, it's a very expensive medication and there's not a lot of data out there to suggest that it's helpful. But if their epithelium is involved, yeah. So if they had like that meta ulcer, that big ulceration, you might think about it too. And there, there's studies that show that they're, they have better outcomes if you use topical if they have like Epithelial, yeah. just epithelial. Not great studies. If you look at the HEDGE trials, the topical really did nothing, but it's hard to know. I mean, you're essentially just getting, because they were all on oral acyclovir too, so you're getting a high um, antiviral load both ways, but in sort of clinical practice, it seems like it's helpful. And the, the, whole, the reason why you're trying to get their epithelial disease to resolve quickly is because of the scarring that can happen. The longer it sits, they're sort of ulcerated. All right, what about this one? Yeah, so pretty classic. You can almost draw a line right here, right? Maybe not, you got a few over here. This guy's dermatomes didn't quite follow the perfect pattern. Can't quite draw a straight line, but pretty much, right? This is a dermatomal rash. Um, so we've had patients like this that have been misdiagnosed that end up in ophthalmology and we diagnose them with it. I had a patient one time that uh, she, I don't remember who saw this patient in the ER. This was, uh, it was probably two years ago. Um, came into continuity clinic for follow-up for a chemical, chemical injury. So she was a, a construction worker and a bunch of concrete dust sort of got kicked up and blown towards her and ended up in her hair and kind of on one side of her forehead. And she came into the ER. And they said, oh, it's a chemical issue. They sprayed her down and cleaned her up and sent her out. She went to her primary care doctor. Uh, this is just a chemical burn. She had some scabs on one side. She had, her hair was like hurting her when she would shampoo on one side. And I see her in clinic and I'm like, okay, so help me understand how a chemical just hit you on one side of your face and hair and we looked inside her hair and she had all these scabs kind of all over just in like a v1 distribution so treated her with antivirals despite her primary care doctor being adamant that she did not have zoster and she got better but it was just kind of funny so this will happen a lot where you're like this is clearly zoster like we just treat it with antivirals give them a full 10 to 14 day course and call it good um, what are some of the consequences of zoster that you worry about Definitely corneal scarring, yeah. Secondary infection. Good. They can track back into the, into the other cranial nerves and that can be right. Yeah, so you can get uh, sort of encephalitis from this. You can get that from simplex too, but yeah. What other, what nerve runs right with seven? The eight. Eight, yeah. So you can, a lot of times, for some reason, eight gets involved. So you have to ask people, is your hearing been an issue? Has it been an issue? So I had a patient just like two weeks ago, came in for zoster, he had keratitis, so he had a little bit of whitening of his cornea. He had pretty much completed a full dose, full dose of acyclovir. Um, but I just said, how's your hearing? And he's a 75, 80 year old guy, he has hearing aids, and he said, it's been getting worse over the last couple of weeks, like significantly worse on the same side as the rash. So how do you treat these people? Steroids, steroids right? You have to give them oral steroids to try to prevent their hearing loss from getting worse. So I gave him a Medrol dose pack, sent him back to his primary care doctor to sort of watch out for his hearing because they can have pretty significant hearing loss from this process. Um, what else? Kind of a long-term consequence, way down the road, that has nothing to do with their corneas. Just post or... Huge issue, right? Major issue. 
These are the patients that drive you nuts in ophthalmology because they have eye pain and it's post-herpetic neuralgia and you can do absolutely nothing for them. Gabapentin, Neurontin, those medications can sometimes help, but you've got to get these guys into it as a pain specialist if they're having that. So the, the thought is that there's pretty good evidence in the literature that if you start the medication early, acyclovir or antivirals, then it can prevent post-herpetic neuralgia. So typically within the first five days is what you want to do. But um, sometimes these are tricky to diagnose early on. I had a patient that showed up to Dr. Mifflin's clinic. She had cataract surgery, was doing great, was complaining that her neck was kind of sore, had some swollen lymph nodes sort of on that side, but everything looked pretty normal. I don't know what's going on. She comes back two weeks later, big old rash. She had been treated by her primary care doctor, and we're like, oh, that's what it was. So zoster's kind of tricky. Um, you have to sort of pay attention to that when people are complaining of sort of one-sided pain, swelling, thinking, thinking about zoster. Because a lot of times you'll, it'll come on with that sort of sensitivity of the skin before a rash pops out. All right, somebody describe these dendrite-looking things. What'd you say? It looks like they do have terminal bulbs. Sort of, right? Yeah. The terminal bulbs are usually a little more clean <coughs> than this. So these are kind of like, eh, I don't know, they're just kind of branching, branching corneal lesions that stain with fluorescein, right? Branching corneal lesions that stain with rose bengal. But a terminal bulb, I'll show, I think I have one in here, is like a really big spot right on the end of these little branches. So this is kind of a pseudodendrite is what you call it with zoster. Kind of a tricky one. If you see a patient with this, little subepithelial infiltrates. You can see some corneal nerves here. Another sort of slit beam of it showing you that it's just in the anterior stroma. Really superficial. So this could be signs of an old um, keratitis that was caused by zoster could be a viral keratitis, other like adenovirus or one of these other ones too. So this is a classic picture of neurotrophic keratopathy. So this is a very tricky one. I've, I've had a patient come in like this, and um, I wanted to treat with broad spectrum antibiotics because I was really nervous. We cultured it and treated him with steroids. I was scared. He got better. I would have done something different, but he did fine. It was clear that it was sort of a neurotrophic situation in his case. But an angry eye with a hypopion, you're thinking infectious, right? So you're going to culture this. You may put them on some antibiotics and kind of nurse this back to health. A lot of cases, these need um, tarsorophy, so you need to get their eye closed. You can tape tarsorophy them if you're not really sure what's going on. So you just essentially have them close their eye and just put a piece of tape right on their upper lid. That'll keep their eye closed a lot more than having it open no normally. So this is a case where this guy is tearing way too much, right? Listen to patients. I, have, I had a big gush of fluid yesterday and now I, my eye won't stop watering. They're gonna call. They're calling you on the phone. Use tears, right? Your eyes just like responding to something. Flush it out. We well, might flush out their iris and lens if you're not careful. So you see, just kind of whitening on the cornea, and then there's kind of a thin area right there. This is a positive Seidel test. So somebody explain why it looks like this. Well, how do you do a Seidel test? And, how do you interpret it, Nico? You put fluorescein in the suspected area of perforation, and then, you know, fluorescein is going to be like around green. So when the fluid's coming out, you would see dilution of that and maybe showing that kind of dark spot and maybe running down as well. Yeah, so this is the area where the fluorescein is getting cleared, right? This is sort of your thick fluoresce. When you put really thick fluoresce on there, it almost looks black initially. And then um, you'll have aqueous kind of clearing it and kind of streaming down. Sometimes these are kind of subtle. When I'm usually doing a Seidel test, I have my finger on their upper lid and I'm wiping the fluoresce on. If I don't see anything obvious, I actually push just very gently 
on their globe very, very, very gently to see if you can get an efflux of fluid somewhere. If you push hard enough, you might pop the eye open, which is not good. So you just have to be really gentle with these kind of situations. But this was a, a zoster case that perforated. This is what you'd kind of see in zoster is kind of this sectoral iris atrophy. So you can see this just kind of ratty iris. Clearly something's happened to it. A lot of these patients have not had cataract surgery, so you can't blame it on a cataract surgeon having an iris come out of a wound and back in the eye. And so that's, that's pretty typical of what you'd see, kind of normal iris next to areas of ratty looking iris. Okay, so what are you gonna, how are you gonna test for herpes? So in most cases, you just swab it and send it for PCR. Don't culture viruses, get a PCR. They're a lot more sensitive. Um, sometimes you have to get into doing an anterior chamber tap, especially for CMV and EBV. Um, checking uh, corneal sensation can kind of help you understand that this is a virus because there aren't a lot of things that cause damage to the corneal nerves that cause a neurotrophic keratitis, keratopathy. So check corneal sensation on subsequent exams. It shows that they're at high risk of having issues in the future with uh, sort of epithelial breakdown and thinning and all kinds of stuff. So you wanna know what their, the status is of their fifth cranial nerve. Okay, so some things that are sort of sequelae, I think we've talked about most of these, um, but uh, neurotrophic keratitis, interstitial keratitis, you get recurrences with stromal and anterior uveitis. This is something that you, this is the reason that you dilate everybody with uveitis, right? You got a patient who comes in with anterior uveitis, you need to dilate them and make sure that there's nothing going on in their posterior segment. Um, cases of retinitis have definitely been missed um, because patients aren't dilated. And these are blinding issues. Having acute retinal necrosis or progressive outer retinal necrosis, they need completely different treatment compared to um, just an anterior uveitis. Uh, Poster pedic neuralgia are really common in zoster. Same thing, neurotrophic keratitis, stromal haze. If you see whitening in a patient with zoster, they need more steroid. So if you've got their epithelium healed and they're white, more steroid. They come back, they're clearing up, then they come back, they're white, more steroid. So these sometimes, sometimes these patients, you're trying to taper them off of steroids to avoid some of the side effects and they're just steroid dependent to try to keep their corneas clear. Um, same thing, retinitis. CMV, EBV, kind of long-term endothelial failure, corneal edema, um, sneakia with anterior chamber stuff, sort of similar things that we've talked about. Um, recurrences, we just talked about the zoster. It's an immune response. You need to treat it with uh, steroids. And most of us kind of chicken out and give them antivirals, even though they don't really need them. Once they've had one full dose um, and full course of antivirals, they don't really need them again with zoster. Um, HSV is different. A lot of times you prophylax them. I, if I personally had herpes simplex virus on my eye, I'd be on acyclovir for the rest of my life. But some people, you try to get them off of it the first time and if they recur, treat them for a year. If they recur again, then sometimes you'll just keep them on low dose forever. 400 twice a day, 800 once a day, something like that is kind of a prophylactic dose. So primary infection with, uh, is, it's usually gonna be an epitheliopathy with simplex. So you've got the acyclovir 400 five times a day or 800 three times a day, topical gancyclovir. Um, with zoster, it's a little bit different dosing. Uh, hearing loss we talked about. I like Valtrex in some of these situations. It's more expensive but easier to take. Again, we talked about this already, immune reactions on the retreat, on the recurrences. Okay, questions about viral stuff? Okay, all right. What time is it? We'll go through a few slides of just kind of talking through some keratitis. Bernheisel.
Do you think it's active or inactive? Yeah, it doesn't really look all that angry, does it? You can't see the conge to see in this situation, but the cornea looks pretty clear around the spots, right? So it's probably inactive. So hallucinate a little bit with me. If I just like draw this line in here, you see this branching, mm -hmm. sort of branching here, branching here. Maybe this was a big terminal bulb, another branch here. So this is kind of like a ghost scar from an old herpes simplex virus infection. And so um, this could be what you're left with. Sometimes this patient would see 2015 with a contact lens. You'd be kind of surprised. Um, sometimes their vision's kind of crappy, but that's pretty typical of sort of a scar you would see after a simplex infection. All right, what do you see here? You might have to think back to different lectures. Uh, Chris. So, it looks like there's no epithelial defect, but there is some scarring probably. You can almost see some of the branching again. If you squint in this case. This weird branching stuff, right? Yeah. Lines in the cornea, hate them. It's just like, what is this thing? So what, else, what can give you like a dendritic pattern? What kind of things? So simplex. Um, simplex and zoster, right? Yeah. Biggest things on your differential. So it's not one of those. Something else. Some other sort of infectious parasite, maybe bacterial. I don't know why that would be branching though. That would make sense to me. So, so this one happens to be acanthamoeba. So acanthamoeba can give you dendrites, dendrite-looking things, but they're not crisp dendrites. They're not normal-looking dendrites. They just kind of give you, it's like, is that a dendrite? Mm, maybe. And the cornea is going to look quite a bit different, but this was an acanthamoeba patient. Obviously, they're going to have like a history of contact lens use as well. What do you think about this one? Lee, you want to take this one? Sure. Very good. What class are you in in high school, if you're looking at a picture like this? <laughs> this is geography, right? Yeah, you know, like what, what country are these? Uh, you know, this, so this is a geographic ulcer, right? That's what they call it. It looks like countries in the middle of the ocean. And so this is a, a big, huge ulcer that you might see with a simplex infection. So this is the sort of geographical sort of presentation compared to the dendritic presentation of this. So this is a bad epitheliopathy. This is going to be a tough one to treat. Mike? This looks bad. It's, uh, I mean, wet or dry? Wet. Very wet, right? Very wet, very inflamed. Keratoconjunctivitis. It's a big fancy term. I like that description. So what do you think it is? Uh, a soupy, nasty ulcer in a contact lens wear. Yeah, thinking from the last lecture, I'd be worried about pseudomonas. Very good, pseudomonas. Okay, so what do you think about this spot right here? And this spot right here? Yeah, Maybe like, right here. Uh, kind of like Dan was mentioning in that other picture, you know, you start to see through a little bit, so you're concerned that it's pretty thin. Yeah, so this might be one that would shock you and it's cytopositive because there's so much soupy junk in there, you're not really sure. But in this case, it's not. It's just really thin in those areas. So you just have to watch them really close. So in this case, we would treat with topical. Um, you could potentially even just go straight to Tobra and Septaz, double, double coverage for um, Pseudomonas. Um, if it gets any thinner, we might throw some glue on there. We're, we're gonna try to buy some time because this patient, if we had to treat them, now they would need a total cornea transplant because you have to cut out the entire cornea because you couldn't suture to this. So this patient's at really high risk of losing their eye. Um, you're going to want to do a gentle B scan on this patient to see if they have actual endophthalmitis, which would change your management. Okay, so pseudomonas nasty, disgusting ulcer.
can I ask you one more thing about the house picture? Mm -hmm. Is that, so they don't have any eyelashes there, right? So or is this like a burn patient? I don't know about this patient, but sometimes no eyelashes just means they've been chronically inflamed. This ulcer's probably been going on for a while, presenting late, late in the game, but don't really know. Could be. What about this one? Nico? It's like a ring? Yeah, it's like a ring around it. The cornea itself is, you know, thin computerly. Um, let's, look at, let's look at the thickness a little bit. So, uninvolved cornea, right? Yep. Right here. Corneal thickness from here to here. We go down here. What's the cornea doing now? It's like splitting. So it's thicker, right? Yeah. So it's, there's some edema. And then you come down here, and it may be... Pretty similar, hard to tell. Might have some thinning there. So you've got a ring infiltrate and an angry eye, contact lens wear. Classically, acanth amoeba, right? Okay. Jack, what do you think? Uh, like a so this is a classic sort of terminal bulb case. So you can see like a pretty clean ulcer with these nice little spots on the end that kind of go big. When you see a zoster case, they're just kind of branching and they, they're not usually going to have that nice terminal bulb on the end of it. So this is a good one to treat with cancyclovir and oral antivirals. We saw this picture before. What are these? Hmm? Maybe. They're crystals. It's a crystalline keratopathy. It could be fungal, most likely. What's the most common sort of board answer for crystalline keratopathy? Strep, right? But it could be a lot of different things. This case actually was a confirmed enterococcus. So you just have to scrape them and figure out what it is. Yeah, you want to go. You want to go for the uh, probably this area here. Yeah, kind of where the meat of the ulcer is. Do we see this picture already? It's a different one. What is this, Reese? KP, right? Carotid uveitis. So, could be anything, right? You're going to check this patient usually for TB, syphilis, and sarcoid just to cover Dr. Vitali and then figure out how to treat them. It's kind of tough, it's hard to know for sure. All right, good job. If you want to do well in cornea, you have to look at pictures because the boards, is, they're gonna give you pictures like this and ask you really obscure questions. And so you have to really look at a lot of pictures, get a good atlas. This Kratchmer Pele atlas is pretty good. What did you say? What was that? Kratchmer Pele corny atlas. I think we have a couple of pretty good atlases upstairs. Um.